Good morning. It is Sunday, September 13th, and welcome to online worship at Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church. I am Tom Sweets, the pastor, and we are gathered together even though we are online and we might not be together in the sanctuary. We are worshiping the Lord. We're giving to the Lord our hearts, our minds, and our souls. We're allowing the Lord to speak to us, to bring his word alive within our hearts so that our lives might be transformed and we might be prepared to serve him and to meet the Lord. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 149 as we are called to worship. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. Praise his name in the assembly of the faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker and let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with timbrel and heart. For the Lord takes delight in his people and he crowns the humble with victory. Praise the Lord. Let us come before the Lord with praise and thanksgiving. Let us come into his presence with joy. Let us bring our whole lives as, as an offering to God on this day. Amen. Our first scripture lesson in the Old Testament lesson comes to us from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Hannah, Samuel's mother, was, with, was barren, was without children, and she prayed to the Lord, and she said, Lord, if only I could have a child, I would dedicate that child to you. And so the Lord sent to Hannah uh, Samuel, who would be a great prophet, one of the great prophets to live in Israel. And, and he would anoint Saul king over Israel. Um, he would uh, anoint David king over Israel. Saul, uh, Samuel was called by God and served God and built up the worship of God and the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, Hannah came before the Lord and God answered her prayers. And then she took little Samuel up to the temple and it says she made a little robe for him every year and brought him a new little robe. But when he was just a few years old, she took him to the temple and he lived under the great high priest, Eli. And in chapter three, we have the story of God calling Samuel. And we're thinking today about God's mission and God's calling in our lives. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord were rare and there were not many visions. And one night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel and Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. So he went back and he lay down. And again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And a third time the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. And here we have the calling of the disciples in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's writing is very brief, like a, a newsletter account or a news article on the internet. It's a very brief account with just the facts, not a lot of interpretation. And if you read Mark, it looks as if Jesus was just walking along and called to these people. They, they immediately left the boats and followed him. He just isn't giving you all the details. Jesus had been in the Galilee area. Jesus had been involved in ministry and was baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus has now started to preach the gospel himself. And then he calls these disciples. So there's a little bit more to it than it might appear on the surface in Mark. But listen to the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother, Andrew, 
casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before the reading from Paul's epistle, I would like to give to you a call to offering, and I would like you to remember the church. Um, we need your help and your gifts, particularly at this time. I believe Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church has been one of the leading churches in Cincinnati during the outbreak of the coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, we have been, we've, we've only not met on three Sundays, and that was because of the the um, recommendation of the governor. As soon as we could meet, we were back on the 12th and we've been back every Sunday. We have about 70 people or so that pull up in the parking lot on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. And we have about 40 or to 50 people that are in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings at 11:15. I encourage you as soon as you're able to get back to worship and to come and join us either in the parking lot or in the sanctuary. And, and, and just enter back into that fellowship of the Lord. You can't see everyone in the parking lot, but you can feel the spirit and it's good. And just a little, a little verse of call to offering. In Malachi chapter three, verse 10, the prophet says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you will not have enough room for it. This is what the Bible says. Bring a tithe. The tithe is 10%. We set aside 10% for the church and for the ministry of the Lord. We don't want to hamstring the work of the Lord. We don't want to be cheap with the work of the Lord. We want the church to be blessed and be a focal point of blessing in this community in Madeira, Ohio. And this is what, what the Lord says. If you bring your tithe into the storehouse, I'm going to put so much blessing into your life that you won't be able to stand it. You won't be able to count it. It's going to be so good. So bring the full tithe into the storehouse of God that you may experience the full blessing of God. And friends, this is your call to offering. You can send a gift to the church. You can go online and give. You can send someone to the church with an envelope. You can call us and ask for an envelope. But please remember the Lord this week and in the weeks to come in his church, Madeira Silverwood Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Now, our final scripture lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I was going to use verses 1 to 15, and then as I got looking at it, I thought I'm going to make two sermons out of this, uh, not, not just one. And so the sermon this week is going to focus on a mission from God. You have a mission from God. You have a calling from God and you have a mission from God. And we'll see this in these first 10 verses. Paul was seeking that the Corinthian church would be unified and be full of the spirit of the Lord. And we see this, this in these first 10 verses of 1 Corinthians 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. For you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants or the one who waters have one purpose. They will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So as you look at the uh, third chapter of 1 Corinthians and, and get into this chapter, we see that Paul's really encouraging the people of Corinth to grow up and be mature. Have you ever said that statement to someone? Have you ever said, grow up? Well, it's frustrating when people are living uh, in immature life or lifestyle. And when you have to deal with that every day, it becomes frustrating. And Paul was getting frustrated with the church, as you might have been frustrated sometimes with someone in your home or a good friend, and you want to just say, grow up. And they were, they were arguing over who was the best pastor. And, 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 and Paul said, look, I planted and Apollos watered, but it's God who gives the growth. And and the focus that I believe that Paul is trying to give the Corinthian church is that they should be focused on their mission. They should be focused on what God is doing in their life. And here's the truth. You are transformed by your mission. You are transformed. God has a mission for you and a purpose for your life. And your mission, by the way, defines you, the mission that comes from God. And your mission, by the way, is not a mission that someone else can do. You're uniquely qualified for it. And your, wit your mission is a witness to God. When you are doing your godly mission, God is looking good. And your mission, by the way, tells the salvation story to family and to friends. Your mission builds the kingdom of God. And in the church we grow in our personal understanding of who God is and who we are, and we grow in our love and in our good deeds towards others as we undertake our mission towards God. Now, let's think about something that the Corinthian church might have been doing wrong so we don't make the same mistake. The church in Corinth had been a bit of a club, uh, everyone else had their temples and they had their places to go. They had their secret societies. They had their uh, uh, philosophic gatherings. And the church had become one such gathering. But the church is not a club. A club is some place that you, you have earned and you deserve and you pay a certain amount of dues and you go there and you make friends there. You expect a certain amount of service in the club. Well, gosh, if I'm paying dues here, they ought to be serving me. They, they, they ought to bring the food out. It ought to be a little hotter. I'm paying a lot of dues to be at this country club, and they ought to serve me a little bit better than this. And if the church becomes a club, people start thinking, well, what's the church doing for me? And by the way, if this church isn't so good, I think I'll go to the church down the street. They have better uh, video, better band, uh, better food. I'll go there. That's a club. That's an immaturity. The church is not a club. The church is not a fraternal organization. That is, a group of like-minded people get together to meet um, a, a mission goal. And, and fraternal organizations were particularly uh, powerful in our society uh, probably 100 years ago, and they still continue to exist with the fraternities on college campuses um, and different organizations, many of which accomplish good things, but the church is different than that. The church is not a community center or a cultural center. But the church is a place and should be a place where you find your mission in life. That is, you get to know God, you understand what God is calling you to, you relate to other people who are also Christian, and they observe your life and say, hey, you're good at this. You bounce things off of them. You know, I think I like to teach. Could you see me being a teacher? Or I think I'd like to go here or do this. Do you think this would work? And the church affirms God's calling in your life. Yes, the church is a place of worship, of prayer, of fellowship. But it's a place where we discover our purpose in life. As Rick Warren said, our purpose-driven life. So the discovery of the mission is, is tightly called with our calling. God has a calling on your life and mine. And that's all tied up in our mission. I included one of the scripture readings today uh, of the story of Samuel. In the story of the calling of Samuel. Samuel was a great prophet of God. 
Um, and Samuel lived back in the day of Saul and of David, about a thousand years before Christ, or about 3,000 years ago is when Samuel lived. And I don't know if you know the story of Samuel, but I'm just going to review that for a minute so we understand what's going on. Samuel had a mother, and her name was Hannah, and Hannah had a husband, and his name was Elkanah. And Samuel would become one of the great uh, people in the whole Old Testament. He was the prophet that, that anointed Saul, and then he anointed David. So he was the prophet that led into the great golden age of Israel. And uh, Elkanah and Hannah, uh, they actually were childless. Now, Elkanah had another wife, too, and her name was um, Peninnah, and she had many children. So he had two wives. His one wife had many children, but his favorite wife was Hannah. Sound familiar? This, this is a recurring theme through Scripture, and um, this, was a, this was the case with Jacob, uh, but this has been, it seemed to be the case through Scripture. So there is one wife who was very uh, 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 productive in terms of having children. And by the way, uh, she made fun of, abused, and was mean to Hannah, Elkanah's other wife. Now, Elkanah headed a godly family. He worshiped God every year. He went to Shiloh, into the temple at Shiloh, where he worshiped God. And Elkanah loved Hannah, and he was her distress was also his distress, showing you that he was a good and a godly man. He wasn't cruel in any way to her. He always loved her and, and, and favored Hannah, but Hannah had this terrible, um, terrible difficulty in her life, and the terrible difficulty is that she was barren. She was childless. And Elkanah tried to encourage his wife. One time he said to her, Oh, Hannah, why are you so downcast and so discouraged? Aren't I worth any 10 sons? Well, he was trying to be helpful, but you can see a comment like that wasn't. And about the moment that he said that, Hannah got on her knees and she prayed to the Lord and she said, God, have mercy on me and relieve this burden. And if you would just give me a child, then I will dedicate that child to you and dedicate that child to your service. So as providence would, ha would have it, as Hannah was praying in the temple, this very thing, that she, if, she, if only she had a child, uh, that she would dedicate that child to God. While they were in the temple, Eli, the great high priest of that day, um, looked at her and he thought that she was mouthing words that, uh, because she was drunk. He saw her lips moving, but her not making a sound. And he thought she was drunk and he said something to her. She said, no, 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 I'm not drunk. I, my soul is in agony and I'm seeking the Lord. And so she had a, an encounter with the, with the high priest, but she had also an encounter with God. And she asked God for a child. And, and uh, she went on her way. She returned home with her husband. And shortly thereafter, she became pregnant. And they conceived and they had a little boy. And she named him Samuel, which evidently means heard of God. In other words, God had heard her prayer. And uh, the next year they went up to the temple and uh, she stayed home with uh, Samuel and she said, when the boy is weaned, then I will dedicate him to God. And sure enough, within a couple of years, she took little Samuel up to the temple and committed Samuel to the Lord. And then she returned home um, every year. It's just such a sweet passage. It said every year she knitted him a little ephod, a uh, a, a cloak that would go over his body. And she knitted this little ephod and took it to him every year. But he grew up and Samuel grew up under the guidance of Eli, the great priest at the temple there in Shiloh. And uh, one day we have the, what happens in the, the scripture reading of uh, 1 Samuel chapter three, which was really the calling of Samuel. One day he, he was in the temple and uh, he, was, he was asleep at night and he heard Eli call him. And so he ran into the room and said to Eli, he said, uh, here I am, Lord. And Eli said, I didn't call you, go back and lie down. And so Samuel went back and he laid down and he heard again uh, a calling and he ran in and he said, here I am, you called me. And my son Eli said, I did not call you, go back and lie down. Samuel didn't yet know the Lord but the Lord 
the word of the Lord was now being revealed to him and God was introducing himself to Samuel. And a third time, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you call me. And Eli realized that God was calling him. So Eli said, go and lie down. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What a great phrase. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Wouldn't that be a good phrase for us to use with God? Just to be quiet for a moment. And to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I've got this difficulty. I've got this problem. I've got this issue. Speak, Lord. So Samuel went down and lay in his place. And it says, the Lord came and stood there and said, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel began his relationship with God there in the temple, dedicated to God, dedicated to be a priest of the Lord. As it turned out, Eli's sons were corrupt. Phineas, um, his son uh, Phineas and, and Hophni, they were both uh, uh, corrupt and did not serve the Lord well. But Samuel had been called. It just reminds us that often we're called to do things that other, other people are not doing well. And that's why we have to do it. Often we see things that, that aren't going well. And we decide that we need to do it. Maybe this is just the perfect time for someone to be called to be a police officer. Maybe God is calling you to get involved in politics or to be a, a, a good and a righteous politician. Um, what is God calling you to? God called Samuel. And then Samuel became a great prophet of God. Samuel never wavered in his faith. Samuel anointed Saul king of Israel. And when Saul lost his calling and gave up his calling, then Samuel anointed David as king of Israel. So many lessons from this text. First of all, Hannah had a huge difficulty in her life and a huge pain that would not go away. That is, she was barren. So when God puts a huge difficulty in your life, could it possibly be a part of his special calling for you? If God gives you something that looks like an insurmountable mountain, could that be that he's doing something different in your life? That he has a special need for you in a way that you've never imagined? The second thing we see is don't give up on God. While times might look bad and might look desperate as they were for Hannah, here she was being abused by the other woman in the house. She was being misunderstood by her husband, but she continued to pray to God and God showed her that he had a special plan by the way, the Bible says once, once she bore Samuel, then she had many other children. So God caused her to be fulfilled in many ways, but God also was using the special difficulty in her life, her barrenness, to bring about a special calling. So don't give up on God. If things look bad, if history looks bad, if, if it looks as if, if God is far away, just call on him more often. And God will raise you up and God will raise up the leadership that he needs. God uses the special circumstances in our life to cause us to do something no one else could ever do or would ever do. I don't know why it occurred to me, but I got thinking this week about Dr. Albert Schweitzer. He was born in the late 1800s. He had a dramatic impact on the church uh, through the first half and in the first two thirds of the uh, 20th century. But Dr. Albert Schweitzer grew up, he was the son of a Lutheran minister. He grew up in the Alsatian um, area of um, between France and Germany and the, the area sometimes is German and sometimes it's French, the area of Strasbourg and, and on this type of area. And he grew up in the Alsatian area. He actually, his father was a Lutheran minister, but they actually shared their church with a Catholic church. Now, doesn't that make sense? Maybe that's something we ought to think about today. Instead of working on so many church buildings, use the buildings we have better. But he grew up in, in, in this beautiful medieval uh, uh, parish in the Alsatian region of, um, between France and Germany in Gunsbach. And it was said that, that, that the church came out of the difficulty that had emerged from the Thirty Years' War and the Protestant Reformation and he was excited about the fact that two different churches could get along well. And he always believed there was one true Christianity and it didn't have to be defined by different churches. There needed to be a unity in a faith. And you think about what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, he's talking to them about unity. Well, this is what happened with Albert Schweitzer. 
First he became a great pianist, and then he became a great organist. He was one of the most sought after musicians in all of Europe, and, and truly in, in, the, in the golden age of Europe. And he was a sought after musician. He was an expert in Bach. He was amazingly skilled, but he wanted to do more. And so he studied theology. As he got studying theology, he wanted a practical application of his theology. And so he felt like he ought to be a missionary. And if he, if he was going to as a missionary, he ought to take something good with him. So he studied medicine and he became a doctor. And then he went down to the area that is now called uh, Gabon, uh, Africa. And it's, it's uh, an equatorial area of West Africa. And he went far up a river and, and he went to a, a place and founded a hospital and began to care for the people. He preached the gospel. He cared for their physical needs, and he really established a way of doing mission where we took um, uh, the modern principles of medicine out into the world as a blessing to the people along with the gospel. He then was a great writer, and he, he wrote a book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, and, and he won a Nobel Prize. And in the Nobel Prize, they, it, it was said that it was given to him out of his great reverence for life. He was a man of peace and a man of graciousness. So here's a person who starts out as a pianist and an organist and ends up transforming mission, transforming theology, transforming medicine, and transforming his world, a great man. Paul says this, as he's talking about his own calling, not that I've already obtained all of this in Philippians 3, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. So Paul, even approaching the end of his life, was pressing on on his mission and to do what God had called him to. Forgetting what is behind, I strain forward to be everything that God has called me to be. See, he wasn't comfortable. He wasn't a part of a club. He wasn't a part of a cultural organization. He was pressing forward with the mission of God. And then Paul says in 1 Timothy, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. You see, when we undertake a mission from God, God provides everything that we need, everything we need along the way. So the problem with the church is they were like infants. They were only drinking milk. They saw themselves as some kind of holy club rather than this amazing creation of God with a particular purpose and mission. Finding their mission and purpose, being with like-minded people, finding their mission and purpose, and together celebrating and worship God, worshiping God. This is where you desire solid food, to be prepared for that purpose that God has called you to. Paul said they were fleshly. They were worldly. They were doing things to please their own ideas of what pleasure was, not of what God, not seeking God's pleasure. And this was shown in the fact that they had rivalry and jealousy and quarreling. You see, they didn't have a strong sense of what their mission was. They weren't thinking about their calling from God and how God was providing for them. Paul says, you're acting like mere humans. The Lord expects us to rise above our present circumstance and find ways to serve him and do it boldly and to do it well. I conducted a funeral just this Friday and the funeral was for Jeff Wilson, an elder in our church. He was 63, he had developed pancreatic cancer, although the cancer was shrinking because of the chemo treatments. Uh, he had regrown his hair, he looked healthy, he looked better than maybe I'd ever seen him before. Jeff had gone through the Disciple Bible Study series with me. He'd read the Bible through in 34 weeks. Uh, he, was a, he was a man of, of uh, uh, some very high accomplishment. He was, the, he was the head of the solid waste department uh, for the city of Cincinnati. And uh, there were 165 people that worked on him. Every 165 people in the city of Cincinnati pull up before 93,000 locations and dump their trash and remove it every week. What a job, such a small group of people. He managed it well. Oh, he's doing such a good job there. They loved him there. 
As he was there, he loved the people and he started programs of recognizing the people. And they said, we've been here for 20 or 30 years. No one's ever recognized excellent employees, but he started a rewards program and they loved Jeff. I went by to visit the, the location and um, when he first started there, then I went by a few months later and it was so clean and it smelled so good and it looked so good. He did such a good job. But I discovered just a little story there with Jeff in, in, uh, um, in preparing for his service. I wanna share that story with you. Jeff was a big, he, was, he loved life. He was six foot seven, he played basketball in high school and in college. Um, he was just, uh, he got involved in city services right out of high school and got working for the city in the, the little town of Mount Vernon, Illinois. And he loved it and he stayed with city services his whole life. He loved doing garbage and hauling garbage. He loved hunting. He loved a good party. He loved his family. He loved children. He was just a man full of life. And at some point in his life, he, he was coming along and he thought, I want to have a boat. I want to, I, he, it had been a lifelong goal for him. And after a number of years, he finally decided he needed to reach that goal. So he started saving money for a boat. And he finally saved up his money. It was time for him to buy the boat and for his family to enjoy it and for him to enjoy it and enjoy some time out on the lake. And just about the same time, he had a cousin who had MS. So her handicap made it very difficult for her. Her family was taking care of him, but they also had difficulty. And at, at about that same time, he uh, saw a van that would be perfect for a handicapped person. So he took the money that he'd set aside for his boat and he bought the van for his cousin who was handicapped. Now that is growing up in Christ. That is being available for God. That is being used by God. The Corinthian church was enjoying their life and they're enjoying the pleasures of life, but they didn't have their eye on the prize of their mission from God. And Paul seeks to return them to a missional understanding. Here's some words of application. God will take care of any difficulty in your life, but he might be using those difficulties to shape the mission in your life. God will take the things that you love and the works that you enjoy, and he will use those to bless others with them. God is the one that makes your life productive. As you're doing what you love to do and doing what God has called you to do, he will bring his salvation into the world. And by the way, the most satisfying accomplishment or work you can undertake is to fulfill the mission that God has for you. God has called you to do good works. So lay hold of your calling, enter into the miraculous life that God has prepared for you, as you come to understand your mission in life and grow up in strength in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, reveal to us your mission. Reveal to us your calling. We ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now go in grace. You have a calling from God. God has purposed your life and your days for his kingdom. Now that kingdom involves your family and his kingdom as it works out within your own home and family. It involves your church, God's kingdom. This is the place where you touch God's kingdom and it involves God's eternal kingdom. You have a, a purpose that's been given to you. And when you arrive in heaven, God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant to that person that pursues their mission and their purpose from the Lord. So go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.